Soul Night Live number 36. Tonight our guest is Chester Thompson. Chester, good evening. Hey, man. Thanks for uh, waiting through my preamble there. Uh, I'm a big vinyl collector, so I always try to encourage people to, uh, to dig hey. in and dig up the good stuff. <laughs> Nice, nice. Yeah. So thank you for taking the time to chat with us this evening. I really appreciate it. I've been a big fan of everything you've done pretty much. So it's it's a real treat to get to you, man. and talk with you. Appreciate it. Yeah. So how have you been doing lately? How have you been uh, spending your days as of late? <laughs> well, staying in a lot. <laughs> right. Uh, fortunately, I got a little work room here. So I'm actually getting able to uh, get some playing done and uh, connected with an old band of mine in LA and we've got eight tracks ready and we're doing a couple more and then we'll be putting some stuff out later. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. And how would you describe that stuff? Oh man. Yeah, it's always weird trying to describe music. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh man. So, I mean, some of it's kind of funky, hopefully most of it. <laughs> Uh, some of good. Pretty. Some of it's pretty intense. Um, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. It's pretty progressive. Uh, I don't know that it falls into the progressive rock category. It's progressive music. Let me just put it that way. You know. Okay. Um, we haven't played together for quite some time, but when we played together, when I lived in LA, we played together a lot. Yeah. So. You know, it started with a phone call, like, you know, once once everybody got shut in, it's like, you know, how you guys doing? What's going on? It's like, well, you know, we're just hanging. How about I send you some stuff and you throw something on it? And it's like, okay, do that. And so eight tunes later, you know, it's, uh, we've been sending stuff back and forth and, you know, kicking ideas back and forth. And I'm real happy with it, actually. Yeah. And what's this group called? We never named it. Um, you named it, huh? Okay. Well, yeah, it was like one of those weird things between Genesis tours. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, basically, sometimes I'd have like a year off between tours, but then once Phil started touring, then I was gone pretty much every year because, and then rehearsal periods would be pretty extended, you know, months to six weeks. So it was in between some of that. And it was like really ready to go. And I got the call. It's like, dude, you got to be here. <laughs> so we, I mean, we're still dear friends. We still get together and hang out a lot. And, uh, but so I was pretty shocked that when we sent tracks back and forth, it felt like we were in the room. You know? Did it feel like no time had passed? Really? It was like a real pleasant surprise that it, that it was that, you know? And do you think you'll be shopping this around to have it released, uh, well, I'm probably going to release it myself. I'll shop it around, but, I, you know, I've done a couple of, I've been doing more, well, I've always done jazz all my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've done a couple of, you know, jazz trio albums that I was, you know, that felt real good. I did another one, uh, which is, I broke away from the trio format and did some, did one a couple of years ago. And um, I didn't do a radio promoter on this one. I just did it online and, you know, it was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. Um, did broke away from the straight ahead jazz thing and, and kind of dug into a lot, you know, a little more of a variety on it. So you had a trio going, the Chester Thompson trio, was that? Yeah. A, yeah. And you did a couple albums. Um, and was it all originals or was it kind of a mixture of standards and? Mostly covers with a little bit of originals. The second one was a lot more originals. Uh, I didn't have, I did some of the, you know, we split the arranging and stuff. Um, I didn't really have any tunes on it, uh, but the third one called Steppin', I've got a bunch more of my stuff on it, and, you know, the guys contributed a couple of tunes as well, so. Where's a good place to get that at? Well, it was on CD Baby until they shut their store down. Yeah, right. <laughs> Obviously, it's, it's available as downloads and streams. Uh, Amazon sometimes has it in. Um, you know, it, it, I did it on CD. Uh, I happen to not appreciate the fact that there's no put it put in your hands medium these days you know um i know yeah i don't have a problem with cds um i don't have a problem with vinyl either but um at the same time i don't i don't get trying to eliminate cds when you haven't replaced it with anything uh, i agree and it's like you never really feel like you own it completely you know I mean, and i don't you know i can hear it but i can't hold it and look, right you know <laughs> Yeah, you were talking about Frank on the show. 
Yeah. I think he would be absolutely incensed about the whole MP3 thing. I think he would be absolutely livid, you know, um, because you get in there, you work your heart out, you try to make it sound the best you can make it sound. And then they compress it down to this little bitty thing. And it's like, you know, the, uh, when the MP3s first happened, a friend was over and he put on, you know, he played something that was like really obscure and I'd never heard it before. And he put it on and, and he had the, uh, he had the CD. So I burnt the, you know, burnt, he let me burn some MP3s for it because I don't even think it was available in this country. So I burnt, burnt the, you know, got, did the MP3s, plays it, and said, let me, let me just check that out against the CD. And man, my mouth just dropped. My, you know, it was like, it, I was heartbroken. Uh, it took away so much of the sound, I, I couldn't believe it. Well, absolutely. And, and cymbals in particular go, seem to be the first thing that goes. It, you get this awful swishy kind of washy thing going on there. Well, what you can do, I mean, for those, I, mean, I know you got some people tuning in, so... I'm sure everybody's way hip to all of this stuff, but if you're gonna burn, you know, MP3s from your collection or whatever, don't do it under 320. Um, right. Yeah. You know, do it at least at 320. If you if you're on a Mac, Apple Lossless is really cool. That's probably the best, other than the original file you're gonna get. But man, don't go 128. <laughs> trying to squeeze a thousand songs on your iPod or whatever. It's not worth it. You know. No, I don't think so. I mean, yeah, I totally agree. Well, I wanted to go back and talk about some early musical influences and then kind of work our way through Frank and Weather Report and Genesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure some of these you've been asked many times, but um, I've got a fresh audience for you that hasn't heard all this before. So, you know, everything that's old is new again. <laughs> so um, I was wondering, what are some of your earliest musical memories like? music maybe you just heard around the house when you were growing up that you kind of fell in love with like before you could even go buy a record of your own oh man well i mean okay so let me go way back the first drum set lessons were with a family friend a close friend of one of my older brothers and he had chosen to play jazz he, he had played all the soul it was soul music back in the day he had played that and he chose to do jazz he didn't want to do much else other than that but he made the mistake, uh, you know, he was at the house one day visiting and we were talking and he found out I'm getting into playing drums. He says, man, whenever you want to come over for a lesson, you know, come on over. He had no idea what he was letting himself in for. <laughs> so I rang his doorbell. It was one summer between school. I rang that doorbell nine o'clock every morning, you know, <laughs> and uh, not, I wasn't even aware that he worked late. He was working until like two o'clock in the morning, but, you know. <laughs> Wow. But he was, he was great. He'd get up, make us some breakfast, and we'd hit it. Um, the, so I started out learning. He taught me how to play along with jazz albums. I'd play along with uh, Miles Davis and Max Roach and some, you know, some pretty intense jazz stuff. Sure. Taught me how to listen, taught me how to not get lost in the solos. Uh, basically said, you know, learn the melody, keep singing the melody over and over in your head, and you won't get lost when the guy starts soloing because they're playing, that's what they're playing off of. Mm -hmm. uh, taught me how to get the right feel on the cymbals and all of that. Um, and then that led to my first club gig because I was at his house one day, somebody called up wanting to do a club gig and he wasn't interested because it wasn't a jazz thing. And then he goes, wait a minute, I think I got a drummer for you. You know, okay. <laughs> so puts his hand over the phone. like, Hey man, you want a gig? Of course I want a gig. You know, he says, well, I got a drummer, but he's 13. So I had to go and audition, you know, and uh, worked every single weekend. Now, jump forward a little bit to the first song that absolutely captured me. Uh, it was by Ahmad Jamal called Point Sienna. And if any of you guys haven't heard it, I don't care what style you think you're into. Uh, it's the album, uh, with, I think it's live at the, the Parisian or some club, but not for me is the name of the album. It is an absolute classic. Um, you want to hear how a song can develop and just become something special and magical. You got to check this out. I don't care whether you're into prog rock, whatever you're into, I guarantee you're going to like this tune. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the mod, but I'm not familiar with that one. So I'll definitely. Well, you got to hear this one, man. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's from like I'll be shocked. <laughs> so, so you got the gig at 13. When did you start playing? How old were you? Well, I mean, this was between eighth and ninth grade. The first time I really got to really play drums 
was seventh grade, you know, school band. Um, you know, the teacher sort of had to teach all the instruments. And so he was a trumpet player, not really a drummer. Yeah. But he got everybody started on, you know, basic rudiments and reading. I'd actually already learned to start learning to read bef before I even got there because they had these little plastic flutes we used to play in uh, school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember that. And fortunately, my sixth grade teacher, they would put numbers on the board, T for thumb and one, two, three, tell you which fingers to put down and all that. And I said, I want to learn how to read music. I don't want to just read numbers. And she started teaching me to read music. <laughs> so um, that would have been, yes, yeah, sixth grade. What drew you to the drums in particular? Oh, man, I don't know. I had to play the drums. I had, my mother tells a story. She told me, I have, believe me, I have no memory whatsoever. Someone apparently gave me a toy drum. I must have been five or six years old, she said. And I guess I would stand on the front steps and play this drum. And she said people would come around. So I had I, I have no memory of it. I have no memory. I couldn't begin to tell you what I did or didn't do. Um, she gave me a school thing I wrote in fourth grade, outline, you know, what, what do you want to do when you grow up things. And I was visiting her oh, years later. I'd been touring and, you know, having a pretty good life at that point. And she pulled this thing out that she kept like moms keep your school papers. Mm -hmm. And it outlined my whole career that I wrote in fourth grade. I mean, I wrote it in, you know, fourth grade terms, you know, just, but it was talking about touring the world and having a big drum set and having a drumming studio, as I called it. And um, man, I broke down. I actually teared up. It, it really, really got to me. Yeah, I so I guess it was then. I, had, I, didn't, I didn't remember that. I really didn't. Okay, so it was just kind of from the get-go, you know? I yeah. guess so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, what are you, what's the first record you remember buying with your own money? Oh, man, you're going way back. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, man. Or just one that kind of comes to mind from early on, maybe not the first, but. Well, it was kind of, even at those, even in those early years, I was split between, you know, like I say, the soul music of the day, but I'm thinking, I think the first stuff I bought would have been jazz. I don't, I think the very, I mean, I bought 45 singles, of course, you know, there was, there was some I loved and bought some of those. The first album, uh, goodness, it might've been Buddy Rich versus Max Roach. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, could have been Miles Davis sketches of Spain. I mean, no, no. My, someday my prince will come. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Davis someday my prince. Was the one with his wife on the cover. I yeah. One of the first ones. I remember. There's a funny thing in his biography where they like put some, I don't know, some chick on a boat, and he's like, "What's up, mama doing on my album? You know, you're gonna put my wife on the cover from now on, and you ain't gonna do it. You know." So, and it became like a string of albums. I know Cicely Tyson was on one of them later. I mean, he went through a few wives in that time period, if I remember correctly, but they, they all got on the cover. So that was pretty cool. And I remember buying some of the early Motown stuff. Um, there was a James Brown 40, a single 45. And I think it was either Try Me or Please, Please, Please. But the B side was something called I've Got Money. And it was the first... Um, I'm the drums in the other part of the room, but anyway, it was that that whole the first time I ever heard that. First time I think anybody maybe heard that, and it just absolutely knocked me out. Um, so, and that changed everything. I mean, that you know that really changed a lot. I, I think not just my way of playing, but I think the whole world changed at that point. <laughs> yes. oh, Anyway, how a groove can just take over and change the world and say, hey, this is the future. And, uh, that's yeah, that's for sure. Absolutely. All right. Um, and what was your first uh, drum uh, set that you had? First kit? <laughs> Not the little drum that you played when you were four, but, you know. A raggedy used set of pearl drums. Uh, nobody had even heard of pearl drums at that point. They were probably maybe two ply if that thick. <laughs> they fell apart a few times. Um, I mean, we're talking, we're going back to 62, basically. You know, was, that was the year I first did that gig. As a matter of fact, 
when it, when I got that gig, uh, they said to my friend, you know, whose name was James Harris, by the way, they said to him, "Well, he's 13. We got to. He's, he's got an audition. We got to hear him." So he loaned me his set. I didn't have a drum set, so he loaned me his set, and we went down and did the audition, and they actually liked my playing. So you know, I grew up in the projects in Baltimore. We had no money. I mean, which was fine. Nobody had any money, so it didn't feel any different, you know. Right. But I had one uncle with enough credit uh, that took me down to the music store and bought me, you know, uh, signed for, for a new a used drum set. It was a little four-piece pearl kit. I mean, really old school. The the actual tom had a clamp that clamped on the side of the bass drum rim. Oh wow! Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah, okay. Be hard, then it would fall off and roll down the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that was a magical day, you know. Oh, you better believe it. Yeah. Uh, oh man, it was like, yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's it's like that's you want to talk about joy. That was you know that's the stuff, man. Oh yeah, I know. I mean, I was like that with my first guitar. You know, it's something where you sure. just, exactly. I was gonna ask <laughs> where you go by and you're just kind of looking at it in the window every day, going someday I'm gonna Absolutely. get you. You know, I must have stared a hole in that window. Let me tell you. Pretty much, I tell you what, man. And it's like, yeah. So, yeah, never forget those moments. Definitely. So, um, who would you say were your early drumming inspirations? And jazz guys, obviously. I would think Max Roach. Max Roach. Yeah. Um, um, Art Blakey. When I discovered Elvin Jones, it completely messed me up. Um, he was the drummer with the. Uh, John Coltrane, as well as a lot of other things he did, but he had this way of playing time without playing time. It was a pulse. And his independence and his feel was very primitive. You know, it was almost African, but really intense jazz. And he had this way of playing. It, um, he could play outside of time, but you always felt the time. And it started me out trying, he's the first person I really tried to learn to play like. And I would set a metronome and try to play really in time with the metronome and then drift away from it and see how far I could go while still hearing and feeling the time. And um, it's, it's something I still practice to this day, you know? Yeah. Well, not everybody's got that, you know? So. It, was, it served me well with Frank, by the way. Oh, I can imagine it served yeah. me quite well. Well, yeah, I mean, because, you know, at, at one point I'd been with him for a while and the, the European tour we did, the same tour where he snatched the guitar solo and put it in the middle of Sneaker Roads. Right, yeah. Concert in Helsinki. Uh, and yeah, uh, yeah. at that point, Frank had said to me, like early in that tour, he says, when I solo, I really want you to follow what I do, not so much rhythmically, but uh, metri you know, metrically. In other words, if I play a group of nine, I want you there with me. So, and I got, you know, it got, we got to this, this thing where it would really lock and I still had to, you know, keep it, you know, keep it locked in with George and, and Tom Fowler with George Duke. And uh, it actually, somehow it happened. <laughs> somehow we were able to do it. And, you know, Frank Zappa was probably, I still say is the best school I ever went to, you know. Which phase of your career do you think you look back on fondest? Oh, goodness. Uh, it's like picking your children, right? <laughs> well, I mean, it's weather report, man. Yeah. 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 Dude, you were, you were a big fan before you got the gig, right? Absolutely. So I never dreamed I'd be in the band. Alfonso Johnson and I were really good friends. We, we knew each other from the East Coast. Um, and, uh, so basically, he was already playing with weather report. In fact, he called me the night before he left for the gig. He was playing with Chuck Mangione. And... Um, he called me from New York. He was doing a, doing a gig there and he was so excited. He said, man, I'm leaving in the morning. I got the gig with Weather Report. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I left maybe a year later, you know, for the uh, Zappa gig. And people keep asking, well, what happened? Why did you switch? Well, Frank had canceled a tour. Um, he, and he was honest about it. He had gotten a film editing machine and he wanted to learn how to operate it, which is good for him. But in the meantime, we've, we've been on tour so much, I don't really have a, a system, I don't have a backup system in LA. I don't know anybody because I'm never there, you know? Sure. So suddenly I'm without a gig, you know? And uh, like, you know, if it's Baltimore, piece of cake, I know everybody, you know? But 
as it turned out, um, Alfonso was in, you know, they were back in town and Alfonso called up and said, man, you know, why don't you come down and jam with the guys at Weather Report? It turned out to be an audition, of course, but um, yeah, it, you know, from the first moment, you know, played with those guys, it was like, and I had played with some pretty amazing bands prior to that. And there was one in particular, I lived in Boston for about six months. And it was an organist named Webster Lewis, who, I, who was from Baltimore, I knew him there. And uh, I had been on the road, you know, doing different stuff. And when I was in Boston at the end of a run with a jazz organist named Jack McDuff, at the end of that run, Webster came down and said, man, you know, why don't you come up and, and join the band? I'd heard that band and the drummer they had, I can't remember his name, he was phenomenal. But he, for whatever reason, he wasn't with them. So, you know, I, I jumped at the chance and, and it was a band that prepared me, I think, for a lot of other things I did because they had so many arrangements, they got sick of playing them. <laughs> so, and talking about, talking about the ultimate jam band. So it would be, okay, first one on stage, you know, we always noodle on our instruments, right? We sort of noodle around. Okay, first one on, whoever's first on stage, whatever you do noodling around, that's the first tune. Okay. So you could never repeat a set and it would just morph, the whole set would be based on whatever that thing started and it would go, I mean, these guys were phenomenal musicians. I was actually a little intimidated to play with these guys actually. And um, so it was just, there was just no limit. I mean, there were no restrictions, no rules, no boundaries. And man, it was, you might, one set might be totally Baroque. I mean, like really, you know, <laughs> next set might be like serious avant-garde jazz. I mean, it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing stuff. So I think that really prepared me to do something like Weather Report. Um, was this was this band pre Zappa as well? Oh yeah, oh absolutely. So. Yeah, when I left there, when I left that band, I went back to Baltimore and decided to go back to school. Uh, so I went to a little community college that happened to have a great music department. So I did that for two years. I was about to transfer and go to University of Maryland, and you know we're going to do a four year degree thing, and. Uh, you know, through a friend who was Zappa's tour manager at the time, who was also from Baltimore, Marty Pirellis, who showed up on some albums, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, basically he called up, asked, would I be interested in, in an audition with Frank? And uh, I guess the band had gotten so perfect that Frank felt like it got a little sterile. So he had mentioned uh, that he was thinking of adding another drummer, a second drummer with, as he called it, a street feel. And my name got thrown in the hat, so they brought me out for an audition. Uh, my audition, we jammed for about an hour without stopping, just, just going from groove to groove. We did reggae, we did rock, we did shuffles, we did jazz, we did blues, nonstop for like an hour. At the end of it, Frank says, you know, and I was walking past him to go to the restroom and he looks up, he says, by the way, you got the gig, you know? Awesome. So we started working on cheapness right there. <laughs> wow, right then, huh? <laughs> and had you ever worked with another drummer? Of, no, no, I mean, other than marching band in high school, you know. So, so what was it like working with Ralph and kind of finding your place in the situation? It was really interesting because Ralph was such a technician I mean, the guy's phenomenal. Oh my goodness, he was. Oh, yeah, he's he, and I don't think he gets enough due. You know, I mean, there's guys that came later that have names that get thrown around a lot more than his, but I think Ralph was right up there. If well, he dedicated himself to education, and um, he was. I guess he was doing the PIT thing in LA, the Percussive Institute. You know, they had all, and they all got became one school eventually. Right. In the meantime, him and uh, Joe Picaro started. Oh, goodness. Um, Mama, L.A. Music Academy, which is a very successful music school out in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so they were running that. And he, I mean, he's a pretty, pretty dedicated educator, mm -hmm. as well as a phenomenal player, you know. Right. In fact, he saved my butt on the Zappa gig because it was his method of playing our time signatures, you know, because I was, I was struggling with that. I mean, I'd, I'd be, an exper I had been experimenting with it. But Ralph says one day, so man, like, you know, when you're playing this stuff, just it's all twos and threes. If there's too many twos, you count to four, but never count past four. You know, you don't count to five or seven or nine. You just, you break it up into twos and threes. And that was a lifesaver, <laughs> you know. Um, 
so yeah, he was a good guy. I, you know, I mean, I was pretty green at that point. I had no idea. I mean, I was so green that I wouldn't even let the guys pack my drums up. Except <laughs> at the end of the second gig, I was so exhausted. It's like, you pack it. I don't care. <laughs> you know, do whatever you need to do, you know. So um, did you relocate to California for the, all that? or Pretty much. I mean, from that first rehearsal, I was, I was hooked. I was there. I, I didn't actually get a residence until the following spring. We toured. This would have been September. We did a month of rehearsals and went straight into a tour. I don't remember fully. I'm guessing it was four or five weeks, maybe. Then I think we had another break. Uh, at that point, we did Roxy and Elsewhere. When we did the Roxy, the Elsewhere came from some stuff on the tour we had done, you know, the, the other part at the yeah. college thing. And uh, after that, uh, it was a Christmas break. And uh, when, you know, so it was a pretty intense winter, as I remember. So it was, weather was a little too iffy to drive my car out and, until, you know, we didn't tour again until spring. So I drove out before rehearsals, found an apartment, and that was that. Okay. Very cool. Um, can you talk a little more about how you and Ralph kind of meshed? Um, well, because our styles were so different. And, uh, so basically in the day, I mean, it's still, it still holds true to a point. So the uh, soul music, R&B, hip hop, whatever, uh, those styles, you tend to play a bit behind the beat. You know, and there's like this whole 16th triplet undertone that, that makes it really pop, you know, make, makes it really funky. Well, so for the first time, I had to really learn how to play on top of the beat uh, with with a really straight, legit, I mean, I, you know, I played legit music in school band and all that, you know, really straight eighth notes and sixteenths. But then having to, you know, like maybe flip it on and off. I mean, because what I was there for was to add the funk factor, but obviously I had to learn the book. I had to learn all the tunes as well. And um, so we had to watch each other like hawks. I mean, we, as kids were set up pretty close. Uh, I had a lot of him in my monitor and he had a lot of me in his monitor because our natural feels, we didn't lock naturally. We both learned to, to play with each other pretty well, I think. And um, so we had to really watch and listen to each other really intensely, you know. And, you know, as it went on, you know, could relax a little bit more with it. But, but that was definitely... Um, when, I mean, with Frank, you always had to pay attention. You could definitely not zone out <laughs> and play that stuff, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just, it's, it just boggles the mind. <laughs> um, Frank, you know, Frank wrote pretty much everything, but you were not allowed to take music on stage. So you had to memorize everything as well. Yeah. How long were the rehearsals each day? Like eight hours or so? Absolutely. Uh, it was my introduction to 40 hour a week rehearsals, five days a week, eight hours, a, you know, eight hours a day. Yeah. Same with Genesis, same with Phil. That's, that's kind of the norm, actually. Yeah. Is it like nine to five ish or is that the? Well, with Frank, it was 11 to seven. Genesis, I think we were more like 10 to six, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's, you know, we, t we take a lunch break. And there was not a lot of chit chat time. I mean, you took your lunch break and, and you were at work. Oh my goodness, it was it was intense, man. I can imagine. I can imagine. Seriously, boot camp, you know. I, yeah. Um, well, excellent. I want to get back to Frank here in a minute, but I was curious what what are your thoughts on some of the drummers that came along in the late '60s? You know, that like you know, that kind of were part of the fusion wave. I almost consider these guys your peers, really. Um, you know, people like Tony Williams, Billy Cobham. Those guys. Billy got to, you know, Billy and I have become friends over the years. Billy, when I heard Mahavishnu, I was messed up. <laughs> I can imagine. It has an effect on everybody. Did you see them in person? Or? Funny enough, we did a tour and Billy opened for Weather Report. Oh, okay. We actually did a tour together. So I got to check it out every night, man. It was, uh, you know, so we, we got to be friends over the years. And um, Tony... I could never relax around sweetheart of a guy he was very open and, you know, for me to, you know, check out, you know, hang out and stuff. I was, I was too big a fan. I was, oh, just, yeah. I, I couldn't do it. It was like, <laughs> it was, um, Oh my goodness. He, yeah, he was probably the biggest influence after, after all the others. Um, I mean, I think we all stole something from him. 
Oh, yeah. At the same time, I think the things I appreciated and, and really gleaned from him wasn't so much playing his licks, but his approach, his use of space, you know, because he just didn't do the expected ever, you know. <laughs> Did it feel like you were here in a new level when you first heard him? Oh, goodness, yeah. Um, yeah, one of the earliest things I heard, well, I, mean, I remember hearing when I was in high school, one of the guys was playing that, that Miles Live album and Tony was like 17. Right. I was like, oh my goodness, you know. Then there was the Phillies, the Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. Really sat with headphones on and listened through to that. And I was just messed up because you could never predict where he was going. I mean, he just never played the predictable thing. And it was so musical and, you know, um, too many young guys don't recognize the importance of space. True. To me, I, what I feel like after all these years, it's, it's the space that makes the notes important. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a lesson that any instrument can learn, you know. You know it's, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Guitar players in particular <laughs> could stand to breathe a bit. You know, I played some woodwinds in high school, so I think it caused me to, when I picked up a guitar, my, I still stopped to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yes, totally makes sense You're it's just like, almost like the phrasing was already in place and you know, just mm -hmm. switched instruments you know so wow. that's pretty wild um yeah okay so um any thoughts on um lenny white you know lenny white yeah L lenny's a friend um yeah first time i heard lenny was you know uh bitches brew of course mm -hmm. and uh you know later with return to forever uh, well, this band that I played with in Boston, this friend Webster Lewis, had built this one gig. As it, and, and well, I'll take it back. I guess Ralph was not the first person I played with. Uh, it was with Lenny White. We did one of the gigs I did with this band in Boston. You know, we did a double drum thing, Lenny and I. Okay, very cool. Yeah, love him. You know, he's just... Yeah, nothing but respect for him. The guy's amazing, man. He really is. Now, what are your thoughts on some of these guys? You know, it seems like the technical aspect of drumming kept going, you know, a lot, especially with these prog rock kind of cats yeah. like Neil Peart from Rush and some of the more recent guys like the guy from Dream Theater and all those. Well, any no. thoughts on this kind of, that kind of style and mm -hmm. the progression that kind of went from the 70s up through that? Let's back up a little bit. Okay. Um, first of all, Genesis doesn't get enough props because if you heard their music before they had hits, that's one of my all-time favorite prog rock bands. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering how, how uh, familiar you were with the music before you got the gig. Well, I mean, there were no hits when I started with the band. Right. There, there were no hits. We were doing all prog rock. Um, Peter, Peter Gabriel had just left. And um, so basically... You know, first, I guess, um, I, I came in, you know, we were promoting Wind and Wuthering, and the one before that um, with ripples on it. Um, uh, trick of the Tail. Trick of the Tail. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and the stuff with Peter, I think, I think those are amazing albums. And, you know, when I really, I mean, so here's the deal. Those guys didn't read music at all. I mean, it was basically, okay, this part goes that way, and then we had this part, and then we had that part, right? So when I came in, uh, there were no charts, you know, um, and as opposed to Frank, where it was everything was charted, you know. I mean, eventually with the band I was in, eventually we got trusted to the point where sometimes he didn't write a chart because he would just, I mean, the band, we knew him, he could just, he could just tell us what he wanted and we could kind of go there. But the more intense stuff was definitely written. And uh, so all of a sudden here I am, and they weren't really used to long rehearsals because they lived near each other. And as the songs were written, they'd get together and play through them. So when Phil first uh, realized he was the singer, uh, they had been auditioning singers for the album and nobody, they didn't really like anybody. So Phil did the album. Yeah. And they were still auditioning singers for the first tour. Um, then it turns out Phil's gonna be the, the out front guy. And I guess him and Bruford, knew each other for a while and I guess they grew up near each other or whatever. And so he asked Bruford, would he step in and do it? So, you know, Bruford did that first tour and 
you know, I mean, they were friends and, you know, you kind of know if, if when you got a friend in another band, you probably know half of each other's book, you know, you just, sure. you know, the tunes, that, right. So it wasn't that big a stretch for him, I guess. And uh, so they did that, you know, it turns out the second year, uh, you know, Bruford, you know, I, I guess Phil had kind of assumed Bill was going to do it. And then as it turned out, that wasn't the case. And I got the call. By the time I got the call, it was getting pretty late, you know. Right. So they had scheduled 10 days to rehearse. So this is a two and a half hour show with no charts, right? <laughs> right. That's a lot of music to dissect. So, you know, they sent me a bunch of stuff to listen to. I was on the road at the time. I was doing, there was a Broadway show called The Wiz. Sure. And they, they had an L.A. company of it. And I'd never done a big Broadway show, and I'd always wanted to do it. I mean, I, I just love music, all kinds. And basically, uh, so I was doing that. And I was actually in San Francisco at the time. Phil called up, and he had met Alfonso Johnson, who happened to have the number of the house I was staying in. This is before cell phones. <laughs> so Phil calls up and offers me the gig. And was like, you know, great. I'd love to do it. Uh, my introduction to them had been on the Weather Report tour because Alfonso played them all the time on his boombox, you know. Okay. And he played Trick of the Tail all the time when we were traveling. And um, so I was kind of somewhat familiar with stuff. And um, so I get over there. They've sent me a bunch of cassettes and they even sent some vinyl, which I've got no way to play it because I'm not, I'm not in L.A. at my place, you know. Right. So um, I tried to glean what I could. As it, when we got there, the first day, it was like, okay, guys, the only way this is going to work, you got to give me four or five songs that you want to do the next day, and I'll, I'll work on those. And um, so they would do that. I stayed up probably till three or four in the morning. I literally transcribed everything Phil played on those tunes. I actually wrote it out. And uh, so I got a real inside look at, uh, you know, at, at Phil's stuff, you know. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it seems like you got a really good handle on Phil's style, whereas Bruford just kind of... I had no choice. I had to... Bruford just did Bruford, you know, but... Right, well, I had I had to jump in there and try to write out everything he played. Yeah. And uh, so I did that, and, you know, they found it, you know, it was curious to them because they'd never been around that before. So, okay, what tune are we doing? I pull out my little book and stick up on the stand and, and play the tune, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> So that's the only way I was able to get through that, you know, and, um, but it gave me a real respect for what the guy was doing. I mean, he, man, he played some of the freshest stuff on those albums, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, a lot of times he was going for something American, but because his background is, his roots are so different, it would come out totally fresh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, I mean, if you're into progressive rock, then you know about Phil the drummer. But I think for the world at large, a lot of people just know him as a singer. You know, they don't even realize that oh. he's one of the most amazing 70s drummers around, you know. At Brand X. I mean, that man, that, that was some killer stuff, man. You feel like some of the things he did in Brand X came back to Genesis rhythmically and stuff? <clears throat> possibly. Um, it, it's possible. And, and vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah, I mean, I just see a growth, you know, stuff like Los Endos and um, Watt Gorilla and some of those tunes. It seems like that wouldn't have happened five years earlier. He was also listening to Elvin Jones and Tony Williams and all the jazz guys. He was also listening to Keith Moon, you know. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, he listened to all the, the, the heavy English guys, but he, he had a real good working knowledge of all the American jazz guys as well. Oh, yeah. So he's a pretty well-rounded player. So he's got like a ton of influences, you know, but his way of doing it, he's very self-taught. So, man, he just came up with his own solutions and it, it turned out to be amazing. You know? Well, yeah, just the way you guys meshed was just so, so musical, you know, I mean, I'm, I mean, I think the stuff from that trick tour with Bruford was cool, but I just think it sounds so much more sympathetic with you in tow. Well, I mean, my job, well, here, the, one of the differences is, one of the things I learned being in England for all those rehearsals, right, um, and meeting other musicians over there and stuff, it's interesting because it's a healthy way to come up playing music. If you're doing pub gigs, uh, the general public does not want to hear cover tunes. So you have to write. So they're encouraged to write from a very early period. I mean, from the beginning, they have to write music. Well, all we do here when you're starting out, you play what's on the radio. 
Now that probably served me well in that I knew how to learn a cover tune. You know, and if people think, you know, it sounds weird to people when I tell them, it's like, well, that was a cover gig for me. Because <laughs> those are not my drum parts, you know. That's I mean, true. probably the world's best cover gig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, amazing, amazing staging, too. It just kept growing every year. I mean, I but that whole thing of really digging in and knowing that I'm there to play what's here, you know, what's on this thing. Now, even my own feel would come through, and that, that seemed to be okay. But no, I really set out to really try to honor what was there. I didn't, I didn't go in trying to impose my thing on that. When you did, uh, when you played on his solo stuff, were, were you ever, were you again just reproducing his parts or did he ever come to you and say, you know, what would you do here? No, my, own, my only input, uh, the early drum duets, he wasn't used to soloing at all. So I tended to put maybe the first two or three together, you know, the first 70, 77, 78, maybe, you know. Mm -hmm. um, by then, he was a little more comfortable once we had kind of jumped in the water. So we would collaborate. I mean, basically what we eventually did, which we did on that last tour in 07, you know, the whole thing, conversation with two stools. Well, that's how yeah. we just wrote the drum duet. We'd sit around in a room with stools or chairs, um, and just, you know, play and just jam. And, uh, you know, sometimes I would record it, but we would just pick the parts we like and just put them together, string them together in, in a musical, you know, hopefully musical way. And um, that's how the drum duets formed. But no, other than that, that, that's pretty much all him. Yeah. Was there ever any thought of having you and Daryl play on a studio album? Or Not really. Uh, in the beginning, Phil, talked about me coming over to do some of the recording. And, uh, but what would happen, um, they would, you know, whoever had the idea for the tune, they would get together and they're all right there. So they track it <laughs> and they just immediately go in and track it. And then once they had their own studio, oh goodness, the, as the tunes were written, they were being recorded, you know. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, one, there was one, Follow You, Follow Me, it was flattering. He was saying he played that with me in mind, how he thought I would play it. Nice. And of course, me is like, why didn't you call me? You know, <laughs> but at, exactly. at the same time, it was, a, you know, it was, I mean, and he, you know, basically, um, that's the only time, you know, I mean, like I say, it got talked about. It just never happened that way because, you know, they were just right there and they were pretty efficient with getting stuff done, you know? Yeah. And I'm curious, how do you think the dynamic changed? Um, you know, the first tour you did had Steve Hackett, mm -hmm. and they got Daryl after that. Um, right. How do you how did how do you think that changed the dynamic? Well, I mean, Steve's a fantastic player. Um, you know, Daryl is an exceptional player. Uh, Daryl, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Jean Luc Ponty. Oh yeah, I love it. You know, the Imaginary Voyage and and the album with him and Holdsworth, uh, Enigmatic Ocean. But are, are you familiar with the albums that Daryl did with him? Um, Aurora and some of those, yeah. You know, uh, so, most of them. And lot and very often Daryl was having to double those lines as John Luke was playing. Yeah, and that you know, and so that level and Daryl used to be in a band in Milwaukee, and basically the club they were playing, you know, I got to know them. Actually, I met them the, the night before my first Zappa gig, before my second Zappa gig. We did we did a warm up gig in, in Austin, at the um, oh, what was the name of that place? Armadillo World Headquarters was the name of the club. <laughs> So that was kind of a warm-up gig for the first night in Chicago, which was the first biggie, which was my second night on the gig. And uh, I went to the drum stop to pick up some sticks and stuff, and the whole band was in the drum shop that he was in. And so we started talking and, uh, you know, basically ended up, when I ended up playing in Milwaukee, we got in touch and there was a club called the Bull Ring, which actually became the stop on the road in Milwaukee for all, all the name players to come through and jam, because these guys were really good. Daryl was amazing, man. Oh, yeah. So um, basically, I knew him from then. And uh, so the big change that happened in Genesis, uh, like I said, the guys originally were only interested in playing well enough to play what they wrote. But when Daryl came in um, and they saw that level of musicianship, all of a sudden they started practicing a lot. 
So that second tour with Daryl, all of a sudden that band did not sound the same. Uh, you could tell these guys have been in the woodshed. They were burning, man. That would have been like the Duke tour? <laughs> Probably. Well, we did, we did 77, 78. We did not tour 79, so it would have been the tour in 80. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think Duke. that probably would have been Duke, I guess. But the difference in their playing was pretty amazing. I mean, they oh, really yeah. fucked up, you know. Well, Steve is a very unique stylist, you know. Yeah, he'll okay. always have that going for him. You know, he's an mm -hmm. incredibly lyrical player. Right. right. Put it, you know, but Daryl is fusion quality. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Two different worlds, um, definitely. What's the first um, tune you remember playing with Genesis? Goodness, that's a tough one. Um... Or. Rather, um, what are some of your favorite ones from the Gabriel era that you played? Oh, goodness. Um, so there's, I mean, there was like some of the stuff from Lamb, you know, Lamb Lies Down, obviously, was, you know, uh, some of that stuff. Cinema Show. Um, How about know. Supper's Ready? Was that kind of... Probably has its moments and then lots of long pauses while you're waiting for guitars to arpeggiate politely. I mean, and basically I didn't play, I mean, you know, there's this amazing thing that happens, like, for example, especially one of the things that I say they, they don't get enough credit for. So the song's in nine, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, you know. Mm -hmm. The keyboard solo is in four. It's in four, yeah. four. And, so, and somehow Phil was able to follow the keyboard solo. He would kind of double it on drums while keeping the nine going for everybody else. That's no, that is not a simple thing to do. And that's just something, that's what he did because that's what the song needed to happen, you know? It was never a matter of, oh, I'm doing this or I'm doing that. He just served the song. He got in there and did what needed to be done. And your average guy is just not gonna pull that off. <laughs> no, man, that's like, you know, when we did it live, I would play the, you know, keep the basic nine pattern going and he would you know, come back and follow the, the keyboard solo. Okay. And from a drummer's perspective, it would have been, you know, more fun for me to, to, you know, try to duplicate what he had done. But, you know, so, um, and then like, you know, he did some, some pretty heavy listening on that stuff. And, um, you know, so yeah, I mean, those, those are the kind of subtleties that, I mean, I'm sure there's some hardcore fans that are fully aware of all of that. But like I say, it, it was a few years later. In fact, my wife, who I met during The Wiz when I was doing that show just before Genesis, um, she came to one of the shows. First time she came to one of the shows, she was saying, there's no girls out there. What's going on? There's no females in the audience. They give it a few years. <laughs> first time, I mean, I will never forget the first time there was a hit single after the first show, the guys came back and the first thing somebody said was, man, there's girls in the audience. <laughs> yeah. At a prog show, what's going on here? <laughs> that's when that transition was happening, you know? Yeah, Follow You, Follow Me, that's probably the first kind of big poppy number and then misunderstanding. Right, those those were, um, yeah, I think Follow You, Follow Me might've been, I think that came before, but misunderstanding really sealed it, you know, all of a yeah. sudden. You know? <laughs> Well, I think once Phil's writing got in there, it kind of really made them, you know, more commercial, I guess, for lack of a better word. But, you know, with that came hits. Well, he didn't think of himself as a writer. He didn't think he could write because he said, I'm a drum writer. I can't, I don't know how to write, you know. And uh, unfortunately, it was that first, you know, when, that, when, his, when, when his wife took off that first time, yeah. he had just moved into a new house. He's in a big empty house with a piano and a studio. And uh, he just poured his heart out at the piano and writing those songs. And, you know, uh, it's a universal thing when people can relate to your pain. They, 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 you know, they. Absolutely. And a lot of the lyrics in Genesis prior to that, you know, were kind of those, well, those esoteric were esoteric <laughs> at those, times. Those were, um, they, they, you know, what I learned from working with them their approach, some of those lyrics would actually almost kind of um, be scaled down versions of different books they, they were reading. Yeah, I'd say it's almost like reading some Victorian nursery rhymes or something, you know? Yeah, I mean, they would definitely- Crimes, pardon the pun. With storytelling, it wasn't so much 
you know, here's my heart, feel what I'm going through. You know? Right. So I think that when Phil got involved with his writing, it brought it to a level that a lot of people could relate to. And that's why they're you know, some silly fun, stuff, you know, but, but yeah, for the most part, it was there. Right. You know, I can't dance. I mean, come on. That's not point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, that was, that was so many great albums. What, what, what would you say are your favorite albums that they did after you joined the fold? What, Genesis? Yeah. Oh goodness. Um Duke was great. Uh yeah, um then there were three, I think, that had some really great. I mean, you know, it, it, like with, with so many groups, I mean, there's a lot a lot of the favorite things and don't ask for titles, but very often, you know, you because you go in there, you learn the tunes that are gonna be in the show. But then you go back later and take a listen to the ones that are not the hits, the ones that are not in the show. And some of those are just absolutely amazing, you know? Um, you know, they're not, the, they weren't the most commercial ones, but man, musically, some of those were just absolutely great to listen to. And it's like back in the day when you had B-sides on albums, you know, they pushed the hit and sometimes the B-side turned out to really be the, the real, you know, sleeper. Oh, yeah. Sometimes that was the best stuff, you know? Um, question about Watt Gorilla. Is that your gorilla that they're talking about? Not at all. Um, I didn't think so because you weren't in the fold when they wrote that, right? That was a, before you came along or a little bit. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, it was before I came. But basically, it was a combination of two tunes. Um, one was, was a weather report thing that he was kind of taking off on, but but again, it turned out a little differently than what, what Weather Report had done. <laughs> and uh, with the rhythm he, that he was playing, he just switched where one is. And um, let's see, what was the other one that, that was a piece of? And that was his kind of first attempt. That was the first time he'd written a complete song on his own. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, uh, I remember, you know, talking about it at the time. We did a one tour, I think. It, it didn't, you know, didn't get played more than more than one tour, but. But, you know, uh, and that was, like I said, it was him kind of copying bits and pieces from, from, you know, stuff he liked. But the first time he actually really dug in and really wrote completely his own music was when he, you know, did that first album, the first Face Value album. Okay. Misunderstanding was, was from that same era after, um, you know, he was alone and stuff, you know. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you heard In the Air Tonight? Yeah, I do. Um, we were in a car in Japan. We would, you know, just got back together. We didn't have, there had been, um, we'd been on a break. And I think Japan was pretty early in the tour and we were riding to the, to the venue and feeling like very excitedly plays us this, this CD version of, um, you know, of, of basically of, of In the Air Tonight. The drums weren't on it, of course, but it was that haunting melody and that, that you know, that lyric and stuff. And it was like, you knew it was going to be something pretty special. Yeah, such an emotional piece of music. Mm -hmm. And then he adds that the fill of all fills. Right. The one even Oprah could play. Did you see that episode? <laughs> oh, get out of here, really? Yeah, he was on Oprah one day and he got her to sit back there and, and do it. <laughs> yeah, I kid you Where's not. That? I look for that. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Um, let's go back a little bit further back to to Zappa. Um, any memories of the Roxy show? You know, it, we waited years for that to be released, and it finally. <laughs> well, it's fine. Looking at the film is like, oh my goodness, um, <laughs> what what wacky stuff. Um, I mean, I remember the gig. It was my birthday. Uh, that that. That second night uh, after midnight was my birthday. That's when when he had the dancer come back and mess with me uh, on the video, and I felt so bad for her because you know he he told her like it's the drummer's birthday, go go mess with him. So she comes back and she decides to lick my arm, and I felt really awful because man, I'm dripping. I mean, <laughs> got a mouthful of salt is what she. Got. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was a it was an amazing. It was an amazing time. I mean, it was a fun show. Really, really fun. I mean, it, and you get that when, if you watch the video. But it was really fun. It was, um, you know, we obviously, we always were well prepared for anything we did. Rehearsals were always intense leading up to whatever. 
those we did two shows a night, which is uh, that's a lot, you know. Of course, the, uh, that stamina of youth at the time. Uh, What's it the same set twice in a row, or pretty much? It's almost never they're going to be exactly the same with him. I mean, right. there's, yeah. there's always something different, you know. How familiar were you with his work before you joined? Not very. Um, that period I was living in Boston, I used to hang out with some guys at a uh, hi-fi shop and we got to be friends. And, you know, we were hanging out and they played some stuff. None of the really killer intense odd time stuff. I mean, you know, um, stuff from further back. And it was fun to listen to, but it had definitely didn't give me any preparation for what I was going to be in for as far as the really, you know, difficult stuff. So I mean, when you joined, was that all that particular batch of music was totally new to you at the time. Oh, goodness, yeah. Oh, man, yeah. Well, the first two days, N Nappy and I joined at the same time. Napoleon Murphy Brock, we oh, both okay. started at the same time. Oh, yeah. So we, we both did the first two days of rehearsal. And uh, we'd worked on cheapness and probably cosmic debris. I'm not sure. but And um, so the third day, the rest of the band's there. Because the first two days, it's just Tom Fowler and George Duke and Frank. So the third day, we got Ralph, we got Ruth Underwood, we got Bruce Fowler. <clears throat> and uh, Frank says, okay, you guys just kind of hang out over here. We're going to play through some of the tunes. My mouth dropped open. It's like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> it was phenomenal. Oh, my God. Man, the only it was just incredible how tight and how difficult that music was and how well they played it, you know. But one thing, what people don't know about Frank, um, you know, there's a consistency with the, all those different bands he had. And the secret to me is that Frank was an amazing teacher. And that's what nobody ever talks about. See, a lot of those bands get there because he knows how to break that stuff down and teach it. I mean, I just almost every day I'd come out of there feeling real good that I was able to play something I couldn't have played the day before. You know, he would break it down. He would do it over and over and over and over and over and over to the point one day I'm getting impatient. I'm like, man, what does God want? It's tight. What do you want? So like another half hour later, it's like, oh my goodness. I had no idea human beings could get to this point, you know? And uh, it would get a little faster each time as you, when you really get it to the point it was flying, you know? Um, oh, yeah. And just to be able to read, you had to be able to get, get through it to begin with. But at the same time, he took it to a whole nother level, you know, and he recorded everything, every rehearsal, every show. And if there was any, if you weren't getting what he's saying, he'd play, he'd play the tape back and it's like, it's like, okay, got it. You know? Wow. So he'd like analyze every show after the fact and, um, very much. Yeah. Make sure to make it even better the next time. Not as much as Phil, but yeah. <laughs> Phil even more, huh? Goodness. Uh, yeah, some, I mean, I never got one, but apparently Phil would pass notes under your door after the show. <laughs> <laughs> you dropped the one on there. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's wild. Um, do you feel like, well, this is kind of a silly question, but I would think that the work you did with Ralph kind of prepared you for the dual drum thing with Phil. Yeah, I would think the dynamic would be a lot different, though. Oh. I mean, from the very first day of rehearsal with Genesis, I mean, you know, as the guys are setting up all the electronics and tweaking guitars and keyboards and all of that, Phil and I, would, would we, we were set up before the others and we just started jamming immediately. We didn't even look at it, we just started. It didn't even, we didn't think about it, didn't talk about it, we just hit it, you know? Only thing he said that first day is like, how do you play the lick? And I knew I knew what he was talking about, the lick for more trouble every day, you know? <laughs> uh-huh, right. And you guys worked that one in Afterglow, I think, or? It ended up in Afterglow. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. It was going to get put, but he was going to put it somewhere, you know? Right. So, okay. and I wish I could say it was mine, but it was actually Ralph Humphrey's lick, you know? Uh, but, yeah, we, uh, but no, we just started jamming immediately, and uh, it just locked. I mean, from beat one, it just locked, you know? Oh, that's awesome. That's and how would you say the dynamic was between rehearsing with Genesis and rehearsing with Phil's band? Was he a taskmaster? Uh, Pretty much. Well, that fir the first tour was kind of, you know, him being a drummer and relating to drums more than anything. It was, you know, it got pretty, 
<laughs> annoying actually because uh, the horns might make a mistake and he turns around and looks at me you know <laughs> it's like me you know <laughs> I mean, it, like everything started with the drums for him, but eventually, as as we went on, he his ears got attuned to it, and you know, didn't I mean it didn't continue that way, but it was that first set of rehearsals. It's like probably the first week of rehearsals. It's kind of like no matter who did something, I'd get the look, you know. <laughs> Would you say that the I don't know how to put this? Would you say it was a slightly easier gig um, playing Phil solo stuff versus the Genesis? Yes and no, um, because, you know, I mean, his, you know, I guess he was coming from more of an R&B perspective, but it was not an R&B feel. I mean, it is and it isn't. For one thing, and in most cases, his natural tempo where he felt the stuff was always slower than I would feel it. So I had to really be focused and not pick the tempo up you know, and really let it sit where he put it, you know, um, as the band would get bigger, because later on, we ended up like six singers and, you know, full horn section and all of that. And sometimes I would actually, uh, actually run a click during the tunes. Nobody heard it but me, but because he's a real stickler for that tempo thing. And I get it, you know, because uh, once you for a singer, when the words start getting crowded, that's difficult, you know. Yeah, you know, adrenaline will get you going, you know, it's easy. That's to... when, you know, I, I get caught up in it and, you know, start really driving it. And unfortunately with that, sometimes it gets on edge, you know. Mm -hmm. So not not for every tune, but, you know, the ones that were like sort of trouble spots, I would I would run a click just to, just to keep it honest, you know. Do you feel like his style kind of simplified in the 80s? Um, yes and no. Um, yeah, he basically had a real sense of, I mean, you know, his, his songwriting obviously got, you know, really improved over the years. And, you know, he was always, he always served the song. I mean, one of the interesting thing about playing his parts, you know, with his solo stuff as well, he didn't necessarily do the obvious thing. Uh, he had a real amazing sense of serving the song. It was not, uh, hi-hat through the tune, cymbal on the chorus, back to hi-hat. Sometimes he would do the complete opposite of what the norm was. And it would really serve the song. So, I, I mean, I learned a lot about that from him, you know. Um, and, but, you know, I, I, I don't want to say simple because his attention to detail was, was so much more. Sure. Uh, yeah, he, you know, he really got way deeper into the details, you know, and which is what a good producer does, you know? Yeah. How'd you feel about his drum machine work that kind of got in there occasionally, like Duchess and tunes like I, that? I mean, I, I get it. Um, and again, they serve the songs well. Yeah. Well, there's a sort of starkness to that stuff that I think the drum machine really suits, you know? Absolutely. Uh, but like I say, um, you know, it's, um, but then as we, as the tune gets underway, especially live, I mean, you know, feel wise, it, it gives you room that when you come in with it, with that genuine pocket, then it, you know, it, it allows the thing to grow. Yeah. It's all the more satisfying when it gets there. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was your, uh, what, the tonal difference between your drums and Phil's? Well, the first two tours, I use, we both use concert times. Okay. Then I switched to, you know, regular traditional drums with double heads. But even when we would play on the chairs or on the stools, you could tell who was playing what. Because of his attack, which is, I tend to use a lot more finger. Uh, it's probably a lot more formal training, I guess. Not a lot, because I'm probably mostly self-taught. But I studied a lot rudimentally. And, and having played in a very structured school band and, and, you know, concert band kind of things. Whereas Phil's thing is uh, not so much technique, but he's like really coming from the shoulder and the arm and it's a real knife edge kind of attack, you know? And uh, it's really funny because his sticks are probably not much more than half the size of mine, the length. He has these teeny mean little short sticks and mine are like longer than normal. But, but you know, as, as with any instrument, your sound is in your hands. Your, your sound is in your hands and your fingers. It doesn't matter what drums you play. Like I say, I don't, I don't 
still have them, but I used to have used to keep a little micro cassette recorder, a little dictation thing, and I would record our rehearsing these drum duets, and then bring it, you know, when we get back to get to it, and we refine the parts and stuff. And you could clearly hear his real edgy thing in my warmer sound, and that's what happens on the drums. But it would whatever we hit is going to have that. What drums were you using back when you first joined Genesis? Uh, well, when I first joined Genesis, I was using a Ludwig kit that I purchased from Zappa. Um, Frank had bought this huge 12-piece uh, drum kit for Ralph and I. Each, each one of us had one of those on stage, you know. And um, so I bought the one I had, had been using because I had a little five-piece kit. And when the weather report kit came, I purchased that kit, you know, from the company. And I used it on the first uh, Genesis tour. But by the second tour, <clears throat> I was using those same sizes, but I had an endorsement with Pearl at that point. Okay. Were you kind of Pearl from that point forward from the rest uh, of the Genesis tours? Up until I switched at uh, 87, I think, 86, 87, I switched to Sonor, which is a German company. Yeah. And I played those until 99, actually. And um, yeah, then I ended up ended up with the DW. Did you have uh, any Simmons or any of those electric drums in there or was that all Phil's territory? Or even had Sin drums. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but then yeah we both had Simmons on like all the mama stuff and all that. In fact we had our drum kits but we each had a Simmons kit on stage because some of those tunes were all Simmons and we would actually turn around and play the Simmons kits on stage. And then after that, I think that was one tour, then we sampled all the Simmons sounds that were being used. And just, were they reliable or huh? were they reliable, the yeah, Simmons? Absolutely. Oh, that's good. You know, I was talking with Bill Bruford um, a few years back and you know, he, that 80s King Crimson is kind of built around that Simmons sound. Mm -hmm. And he said, basically it kind of, it kind of destroyed a lot of the subtlety he had because he had to hit them so hard that when he went back to play jazz, he had to really dial it in and get his, 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 you know, well, I, he, he, I, he didn't take the right approach. <laughs> well, because the, the first Simmons were like playing on a tabletop. I mean, those things injured people. <laughs> hard. They, they hit back. <laughs> so what Phil did, <coughs> Bill had them so loud in his monitors that if he hit with anything more than a touch, they would take your head off. Which meant he played the whole, when he, you know, we didn't play it, we never played the whole show on him anyways, only like two or three tunes. Sure. Um, but he had them tweaked so where he just barely touched that thing and it would trigger. So he never played it hard, you know, and that's, that's, I mean, that's self-defense basically, you know. Yeah, well, that's the secret then. Okay. That makes sense. And, um, I'm curious, what brought on Ralph's departure? Now, you were the only drummer on One Size Fits All, right? I just showed up and played the gig. I was very surprised when he wasn't there. Um, I, to this day, I have no idea. Um, Did you feel like you had a lot of stuff that you had to get together real quick because he was gone, or? Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Well, I knew the book at that point. You know? Right. And at that point, I mean, that, that stuff had been conceived of for the most part for one drummer anyway. Um, <clears throat> although we did have a, we, we had a lot of uh, things we did. We had fills we, that we would program and do together. Uh, we would have two parts in some cases, uh, which Phil and I pretty much did the same thing. Sometimes we'd play the same thing together. Sometimes we'd have contrasting parts, like that, that whole, that fill from uh, the lick as, as Phil was referring to. There's always toms and bass drums going on at the same time with that with that thing. Like you play opposite when one's on toms, the other's on bass drums, and vice versa. So that whole thing is just this thundering thing that happens, you know. Yeah. Um, but other than that, yeah, I mean, yeah, the first first tour, first couple of tours, maybe Ralph was definitely doing most of the heavy lifting, and uh, you know, I'd be playing more time, and he'd be playing like the more adventurous parts. Um, and as I learned the book, I mean, you know, so when it was when it was just me, I mean, I knew what needed to happen. And so, you know, I just it, it wasn't that big a stretch to do what needed to be done. Sure. 
So how are we doing on time? How are you feeling? I got a few fan questions that came in through the chat room. I wanted to run by you. Well, yeah, let's, let's, I got to be up early. We've had a, unfortunately a death in the family. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, got to be up pretty early at tomorrow as a service and all of that memorial service. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with us and I'm sorry, this is kind of a, a late night ramble. That's, you know, I do them at other times too. So if you ever wanted to get together and chat again, we can do okay. it earlier if you prefer. That's fine. So yeah, if you got some, some question stuff, that's fine. I don't have the chat turned on. So yeah, just, just lay it on me. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me go down the chat room real quick and see if anybody's got something in here. I think I saw a couple come in. Oh, I, I got a question for you. That last tour with Phil, did it seem like he was ailing? Like, like. Well, the last, the last thing. Which tour are we talking about? Which um, I guess the uh, the last Genesis tour. Um, because I've heard stories of him having to tape his sticks to his hands and a bunch of. That came later. Yeah. Later. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's when. That's when he did the Motown stuff, which was 2010. The Genesis tour was 07. And, you know, Phil basically has had a couple of surgeries by then. One of them left him with some nerve damage. Um, so the whole thing, you know, when the, in surgery, I mean, I've, we each had two back surgeries. I've had two. And, but he's actually had a neck surgery in there as well, and uh, which controls the nerves to the hands and all that. And if you touch that nerve, it's like a year before it to come, fully come back. And so basically, you know, um, you know, we, we did a lot of double playing on the Genesis tour, which he was not able to do like when we did the Motown stuff. And that's where he has the video. He did the DV, you know, the video with, with the album of him with the sticks taped to his hand, to his left hand and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, no, he was, he was going through some emotional stuff. It was pretty heavy, which we didn't know at the time. Um, yeah, well, just watching that uh, When in Rome DVD, it, it looks almost like he's kind of almost grim, grimaces a bit as he does a fill. Like, was he already kind of hurting a bit at that time, you think? Definitely was. Um, okay, so my my opinion, uh, I know he had some vertebrae damage in the neck, but, you know, when we first toured together, we warmed up before every show because I mean I had you know I had a whole thing that I did and we would kind of do my little rudimental warm up which would really get you ready for the show. And uh, as the band started having hits, they started demanding interviews with Phil, and they would try to divide it up between the other guys. But of course, the interviews really wanted Phil, right? Because it wasn't Phil's band; it was a really equal group. Always was, and. Um, <clears throat> So for the most part, he's having to go off and do interviews, interviews. And so he has to come back and jump on stage without warming up. And he didn't have time to warm up his voice or his hands, right? Yeah. And um, so all of a sudden he's like full steam ahead. It's kind of like you're expected to run a, a marathon or a sprint. You're gonna run a hundred yard dash, but you didn't stretch, you didn't warm up, you didn't do any of that, right? And so between that and his, ten he naturally would tense up in his shoulders and all when he played. You know, and, um, you know, like I say, it's, it's that, you know, he's self-taught and he's phenomenal with it, but whereas like mine is more fingers almost than, than wrist, his is all wrist and arm. And so it just really trashes your shoulder muscles, you know? Well, I can imagine, you know, that's not unusual. I think other musicians have gone through the same thing. I remember Keith Emerson with his kind of two keyboards at once with his hand almost like this. Right. And really, you know, it's almost like that can wear on you after. Oh, years. <laughs> absolutely yeah well listen chester i don't want to keep you any longer but um everybody pleasure to no way yes i noticed i didn't see any chats and they all left <laughs> oh no there i see about 20 people tuned in right now um I don't if, know. There, if there are a couple of questions i'm quite happy to answer um, well here's a gentleman named jeff ryle he said i had the pleasure of jamming with chester during a uh doing a live demo together for steinberg at the winter nam show in la at the atari booth Yep. He's one of my favorite drummers. Please tell him hi. Oh, great, great. Yeah, Jeff's a good guy, man. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. And um, yeah, that's the big one. I, uh, some of them I slipped in as they came in, actually, about talking about the different sounds of your kits and such. So, mm -hmm. so I guess we're good. Very simply, uh, drum, like any other instrument, needs to be in tune with itself. 
uh, you how many rods you got around that drum, that's how many notes are potentially hanging around. So my concept, I try to get the same pitch around each, uh, each tuning rod. So the Tom's got six rods, I want the same note around each, top and bottom. I, t I tune the bottom a bit deeper than the, the top because the bottom head is your tone, it's your EQ. If you crank that bottom head, <clears throat> everything you're gonna do is be, be high and you know tight sounding. If you lower that bottom head, you're gonna be big and fat sounding, you know, so it's, it's but it, it's, it's crucial that the drum is in tune with itself. Otherwise, it's not a problem that drums ring, it's when they ring more than one note. <laughs> oh yeah. And what about like kits that don't have any heads on the bottom at all? Well, that's even easier to tune because you only got the one surface pitch wise. Um, as Phil was reminded when we did do that 07 tour, they're very unforgiving because with the bottom head, it kicks back. You know, it helps with the rebound. With a single head, man, it's all on you. <laughs> all the more work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. I, it was a real treat. And well, Sean, thank you, man. Yeah. You know, I, I know you got a lot of guitar players out there, so. Uh, I love talking to the drummers. <laughs> you know, uh, it's too weird for them, but. <laughs> no, you guys are the engine that makes it all go. So my hat's off to you. <laughs> man, thanks for the invite. And uh, man, just, just wish you well. I, I love what you're doing here and just keep doing it. And uh, ho hopefully we'll talk again soon. Okay, well, that's good. Well, I. I any time I'm I'm always ready to do it again. So anyway. Okay. All right. Well take care, Chester. Say good night. All right. Take care. And thank you all for tuning in. And come back Thursday. I have a special daytime show with Jeff Downs, who's over in England. So it'll be about dinner time for him. But you may remember him from Yes in nineteen eighty or the Buggles. That guy. So see y'all Thursday. Take care, Chester. Thank you.